good. Um, as we get ready to spend some time praising and worshiping the Lord in musical song, I wanted to um, read something that I read earlier this week by um, a man named Tim Keller. And he was talking about worship, and he said, We should worship God earnestly. The ascended Lord Jesus Christ said to the church of Laodicea, Would that you were cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Is it not consistent with the image to say that lukewarm worship turns the stomach of Christ? I was very challenged by this next part. He said, this is why Saturday night and early Sunday morning preparation is so important before you come to worship. It's why the prelude is indispensable. We are not naturally hot. We must trim the wick with the word of God. We must seek the breath of his spirit to blow it into a flame. He will not quench a smoldering uh, flax if we seek him. Brothers and sisters, we must be more earnest in seeking God in worship. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. There is only one reason to come to this service, to seek and to find God. And the Lord God says to you straight from his word, every single day, every single Sunday, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. This morning, I just want you to take a moment and just pause. Maybe you didn't do Saturday night preparation or Sunday morning preparation, but we can right now take a moment and say, God, I'm here to seek you, Lord, with all of my heart. Lord, that you would come, that you would fan a flame, Jesus, that as we worship you, Lord God, we would burn hot for you, Jesus. We would be consumed by love, consumed by adoration, Jesus. That our heart's desire, Lord, would be to love you more, to worship you more, Jesus, for you are worthy, God. You are worthy, Jesus. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King of all the universe, to you be the glory. 
for my vocal in my monitor. Thanks. Thank you, Jesus. He is good. Amen.
What a powerful name indeed, the creator of the universe. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we sang a song pretty early, maybe midway through, I don't know. Uh, one of the lyrics was, Jesus, our victory. And uh, we all understand that Jesus is the victor. He's already won, uh, but the battle continues. And victories are not won without uh, sacrifice and teamwork and all these other things. So, Lord, I pray that uh, while we acknowledge that the victory is won, help us to see that the battle goes on. And, Lord, I pray for all of us in here that we see that and that we are willing to do our part. We sing a lot of lyrics here about refine us and do all these other things. Those are dangerous things to say when we really mean them in our hearts. So, Lord, let us mean those dangerous things in our hearts as we uh, battle for you. The victory is won, Lord, but we just pray that you can use us to, to further the battle and bring more, more warriors into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Lisa. Team. Good morning, everybody, again. I'd like to welcome everybody here to uh, our service this Sunday, our first service here in uh, 2023. I'd like to welcome everybody, but I'd like to welcome anyone who's here for the very first time, other than raising your hand and coming up and reciting the Ten Commandments. We're not going to put any pressure on you. <laughs> but is there anyone here for the first? I'm just kidding about the second part. If you raise your hand, we have a packet and a little gift for you. If anyone is here for the first time. <laughs> I want a gift. You probably read it. So, Well, welcome everyone else. I'd like to especially welcome back uh, Bob Blewett, who has returned to us today. <laughs> welcome back, Bob. Good to see you. And with that, uh, we're going to dismiss for 10 minutes. We've extended our uh, dismissal time for 10 minutes. You can see we've also changed the layout here. So, uh, if I, you know, it's a different layout, so you're going to have to try to find seats in a different way now. So you might have to sit next to people you're not used to. So uh, uh, children are dismissed to go to their church, and we'll uh, go to the bar. There's snacks, coffee, tea, have them. We'll see you in 10 minutes.
two-minute warning. This is your two-minute warning out in the bar. Octone, Octone. Welcome back. Let's say welcome back and then wait for people to come in. Well, when we come back after, uh, after the break, you can really see how many kids are in this church because significantly fewer seats occupied. So again, welcome. Happy New Year. Uh, some announcements coming up. As you may or may not know, we had uh, prayer this past week at uh, two of the churches, the CFC churches. We have three more nights of prayer this week, last Monday and Wednesday at Potsdam, and they were phenomenal. Uh, and then... Thursday at Madrid. I know some people were there. That was also, they're always great. They're always uh, incredibly encouraging and uplifting and visionary. God gives us vision for the year as you try to see your vision. That's, 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 that's yeah, that's not right. So don't pay attention. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. So what's happening is uh, they're all at seven o'clock. Tomorrow night, Monday is in Mawaira. Uh, Wednesday night is in Governor Richfield. I guess it's Governor now. And Thursday is right here at Canton. So if you can make any of those, that'd be great. But especially, uh, we'd love to see you here at Canton. It's, uh, it's a tremendous evening. Uh, I just don't know. It's amazing that we have six different prayer meetings and how different they all are, how God works at each one, uh, very, very specifically to that church. I really liked uh, Wednesday. Uh, in Potsdam, we, they prayed for Potsdam, but uh, the, the idea was they did, uh, I can't remember if they called it pillars or ways, but, but they started, I'm missing one, I know. Uh, they started with uh, repentance and then renewal, and I think re-engagement was the next one, and then redigging of wells that had been taken by the enemy and finally refreshing. It was really, uh, really a great meeting. So love to see you all out here uh, at any of the meetings, but especially here on um, Thursday at 7 o'clock. Uh, I was doing recently, um, speaking of this, it, it kind of reminded me of that, a little, uh, on, on the Bible app, they have all these little short plans, and I was doing a Francis Chan plan on making disciples. As you probably know, most of you, that our, our mission statement at CFC is um, becoming disciples and making disciples. So I was reading this little thing by Francis Chan, seven or eight day study, and uh, he said, this is some things from the study that I thought, they were certainly, they grabbed me, and when we talk about repentance, yes, I've not done these things. 
Uh, it was very, um, it, it impacted me. Paul saw the church as a community of redeemed people in which each person is actively involved in doing the work of the ministry. The pastor is not the minister, at least not in the way we typically think of a minister. The pastor is the equipper, and every member of the church is a minister. God has not called you to make disciples in isolation. He's placed you in the context of a church body so you can be encouraged and challenged by the people around you. And you're called to encourage and challenge them in return. He calls us to a life of faith, not a life of comfort. Instead of coming to him for a safer, easier, stress-free lifestyle, the Son of God challenges us to risk loving others more than ourselves. It's like, wow. Okay, that's um, so. Like I said before, and when we pray, the, when we sing those songs, we you know we're singing the songs, we're worshiping. But when you stop to think of the lyrics, like uh, those are those are dangerous lyrics to pray. So Lord, I pray that uh, that we can we can embrace that idea, we can embrace those lyrics and really mean it. Lord, give us the courage to to pray dangerous things, to to worship you in a dangerous way, Lord. And we we ask your blessing on this. Uh, on our meetings this week, tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday, and we look forward to seeing what you are going to do uh, here on Wednesday or Thursday and here in 2023. Lord, it's going to be awesome. We're thrilled to be a part of it. So again, the meetings this week. Uh, coming up, I believe they're starting the 16th. Is that right, Bill? I know yours is starting the 16th, right? I'm going to call you up in a sec, yeah. There's, a bu- there's several uh, classes and Bible studies coming up. You can check your CFC email for those. Here we get winter small groups and classes. You can check your email. If you're not getting the CFC email, Jamie said to contact him, and he will make sure you get on the list. But there's a lot of great classes, including one that's uh, called Freedom in Christ. And uh, Bill Hull is going to be teaching that. Some of you probably, uh, I hope many of you know Bill Hull. Some of you probably know his more famous children, Anastasia's bakery truck, which you've seen in the summer. <laughs> And uh, his daughter and his, and his son, Ben, who was recently elected to the County Board of Legislators. But this is their father. Bill Hell is going to come up and talk about the, uh, the class. It's a great class, so welcome Bill Hell, please. Thanks. Yeah, I won't speak on behalf of Ben. I'll let him do that himself because <laughs> uh, he can do it quite well. Uh, it is a privilege to be here this morning. Um, I'm just sharing a quick exhortation about why. Uh, we are offering the class that we're offering. Um, many classes are being offered. I believe some are here in Potsdam. They're kind of way ahead of us. They have Paul Brown, so that's an excuse. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so they're, 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 they're doing well. But one of the things the Lord has been dealing with me on and, and where we are in, in Madrid is um, that so many folks are not walking in the freedom that Christ has promised us. We get saved, which is incredible. It's a justification. He did all the work. Boom. That took care of it. But there's the rest of our lives that we have to live with all the baggage from the past life. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. And too many times we look to uh, classes, events, messages to set us free. And Jesus said, those are all good, but they all point to who? They point to Jesus. The scriptures, he told them that the Pharisees, that, that was a problem. They were looking at the, the scriptures and thinking they were going to find eternal life. And he says, uh, yo, guys, they point to me. I will give you eternal life. And so part of what we want to look at is, is, um, is that Jesus has come to take, apart, take away our sins and our shame. He took both of those things to Calvary with us. And many of us have had in our lives other people who have hurt, abused us, and used us wrong. And in that, we, le- we need to learn to forgive them and release it. Uh, And the shame, Jesus said, I'll take. I'll take your shame. And he said, and he took it to Calvary. And some say, well, Jesus doesn't understand. You don't understand. Jesus was beaten. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was spit upon. He was slapped. His beard was pulled out of his face. He had, uh, like nails, the, the, the crown was shoved on his head. He was scourged to the inch of his life so that he would live long enough to get to Calvary and finally die. And then when they put him on the cross, they stripped him completely naked. Someone says, well, Jesus doesn't understand about sexual abuse. I think Jesus has a full-scale understanding. He understands what it is to be abused. And he took that shame so that you and I won't have to have it anymore. And he wants to release us. This is the, the gift that he said, come to me, and I will do it. Learn of me. And that's what the class is, is to learn about who Jesus is and what he wants us and who we are in him. 
So you're not, you're not going to get the healing outside of Jesus. It's only going to be in Christ, in him. We sang that song, the last song we sang, incredible lead for this because it's the powerful name of Jesus. He's the one who casts out demons. He's the one who renews our minds. He's the one who breaks the bonds of sin and death and hell in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, and then uh, Romans, uh, John 8 and 36. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And, uh, and I just want to say that our hope is that we are, we're providing an opportunity on Wednesday nights beginning the 18th of January for 12 weeks uh, to, be, to bring the knowledge of Christ to us so that we can embrace that knowledge, embrace the Christ who, uh, of that knowledge, and receive from him healing in our lives. So we invite you to come and be part of that class. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I, yeah, that's a great class. I took it many years ago. I might take it again. It's just worth, it's, it's great reminders what Jesus did for us. I'd like to welcome now uh, Josiah up here. And I'll give you just let me quick intro for you. <laughs> really quick. <laughs> oh, Josiah, we're bringing uh, the word today. I had the pleasure of taking a preaching class with Josiah. When was that? August, September? I don't know. Sometime in the fall. And uh, I know you're going to be very encouraged and perhaps even a little bit uh, convicted about the message today, but I'd like you to welcome Josiah Tabled up tonight. All right, well, good morning. Yeah, Jamie's down in Syracuse this week, so uh, I'll be sharing the word, and I am excited. Um, the word that I have is something that, like Greg said, um, I feel like the Lord gave to me about a year ago, um, and it's just kind of been... Um, my dad would use the word regurgitating. He's a pastor as well. <laughs> he loves to use like shock words like that. Um, but it's just kept coming up in, in my soul and the Lord's been continuing to uh, open my eyes to this idea. So um, I'm excited. I'm privileged to be able to share with you guys this morning. I appreciate being able to walk life out with you. Um, it is special. You know, I've, I've talked to Adrian about this a couple of times. As a parent, you all of a sudden realize, you know, the Lord placed us here together for some reason. We could have been born any time in history, but for some reason, everybody in this room, the Lord wanted to put us together. Um, and I want to be an encouragement to you this morning. I want to I push you. I want to stir you and challenge you in the Lord. Um, so we'll open in prayer here, but I just want you to kind of settle your hearts and um, really, as I'm praying here, just ask the Lord to, to do a work. Um, I don't want to just be up here and talk for 30, 35 minutes. Uh, and then get down and go on our merry way. I want us to move forward. I want us to do uh, destruction to darkness. Um, so can you guys join with me? Let's just bow our heads. <clears throat> Lord, thank you. Uh, thank you for such uh, this time, Lord, that you've, um, that you've put us together, Lord. I pray, God, that we would have receptive hearts to what you want to speak today, God. Uh, Lord, as we look at Scripture, I pray that your power and your Holy Spirit would just fill us. Open our eyes this morning. Lord, let us stay on mission in 2023. Let us respond today to your word. Um, God, I ask that you'd bless this message. All right, amen. amen. Well, um, yeah, so like I said, I am, I'm excited. Uh, I, I like this time of year in general. Um, I like a plan in life, and... Um, Typically, maybe the first Sunday of the of the year, and this is kind of our first Sunday in Canton, you might expect like a New Year's resolution type of message. Uh, that's not necessarily this, but it, it is helpful in the beginning of the year to step back and evaluate where you're at in your life. Um, and so I, I really enjoy doing that. Um, and recently, uh, it was Christmas time. I've, I've saved a lot of um, my vacation and time off to... to to be intentional about that. Um, and so Luis and I definitely took some time this year to, to step back, evaluate, um, evaluate our upcoming year, our home, um, our, our routines. And, uh, and there were some things that really came out of that that I'm gonna be sharing about this morning. Um, and so if you wanna open your Bible, we're gonna be preaching out of Jeremiah, but I wanna continue with that theme. We're going to start in, in chapter 1 and 2. We'll be looking at that most of, um, most of our time together this morning. Um, 
But like I said, I, I really enjoy the Christmas season. Uh, I try to save, like I said, the majority of my vacation so that I can have time around the holidays to sit down um, and, and reevaluate our school plan, our, our daily rhythms, our responsibilities around the house, um, our budget, and a variety of life topics. This year was a little bit different for me, and if you ask my wife, for the first like four or five days, I just felt like I was in a funk. Um, felt like I, I, I was so excited about getting the vacation and just spending time with kids and Christmas and cookies and good cooking and um, an extra cup of coffee every day with my wife. Uh, but the first few days, it was just something was going on inside of me. And I came to a point where I, you know, I recognized what it was. But when I, when I realized it, I, I, I asked myself, why? Why does this happen to me? Like, I know better, right? I've read the Word of God. I have I have Jesus in me, like, why, why do I find myself in a funk, or why am I not able to just take hold of a simple truth or passage in the Bible and just apply it? Um, and uh, if you ask another thing from Louisa, she'll tell you, um, I love to psychoanalyze things, especially myself, situations, conversations, people. I actually think it's something that the Lord's, like, given me to have, like, some sort of insight. Um, some people would, I think, would maybe call it emotional intelligence, but I maybe spend too much time on it, um, and so, and I also love to fix things. If you know anything about me, um, I'm a, I, I love working with my hands. Um, I don't get to do that at my job. I have to use my mind a lot more, so when I get home at the end of the day, I, I really want to fix things. But the first thing you need to do in order to fix something is understand what? The problem. Why is it broken? What, what's going on? Um, what, what, are we, uh, what are we trying to solve here? And, um, and so often I'm asking the question, why? Why am I feeling this way when I'm reading scripture? Why did that happen? Why, why was that the response? Um, and, and one of the things that, that has really stuck out to me is like reading through scripture and recognizing that throughout all of history, mankind has kind of made some strange decisions, even when they, they truly understand the word of God. Um, and, and it's frustrating when, when we recognize a truth and aren't able to apply it. It's, it's frustrating to watch a movie, right? When you're like, don't do that. Don't go in the room. Or like, why are you going to say that? Um, but what's more frustrating is when I do it myself. Um, you know, there's, there's what I would call no-brainers throughout the Bible. Like, where we sit today, it's pretty easy to see, right? Like, Eve, don't bite the apple. Like, you got one job in the garden, right? Like, don't go to that tree and eat of that apple, right? David and Bathsheba. Why do you think that was a good idea, David? Like, right? It's pretty obvious um, that's not the will of the Lord. But yet, he still did it. People bowing down to golden calves, right? Like, where were they, the, the chapters leading up to everything that had just happened, where they abandoned, and then we're just going to bow down to a golden calf. Um, People getting drunk off of communion, right? Like, that should be very obvious. Um, No-brainers. Um, but it's not. For some reason, something's in us. Um, it's sin. Uh, but it's more than that. Like, I want to understand why. Like, if, if Jesus can set us free from all of our sins, why does it still happen sometimes? So I spent a lot of time thinking about that, and, and we're going to use kind of Jeremiah as a case study um, for this, to look at it and evaluate it and just see what truths we can pull from it this morning. Um, but just remember the, the why as we're, as we're reading through Scripture this morning. Um, so let's open our Bibles to chapter 1, like I said. We're going to start in verse 4. As we read through the Scripture, I want you to maybe jot down right now or make a note in your phone or just pay attention to four questions. Consider four questions as we're reading this, okay? Okay. The first question, uh, because it's always important to know the characters, is who's Jeremiah, right? We all have ideas of who he is, um, but who is he in, in this passage of Scripture? What does he represent? Who is Judah? Who's Jeremiah talking to, okay? What was the Lord saying, and how do we apply it? So four questions. Who is Jeremiah? Who is Judah? What was the Lord saying, and how do we apply it today? 
So starting um, in verse 4, chapter 1. Then the, Lord of the, uh, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in, my, in, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth. For you shall go to all whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. And the word, came, the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot, and it is facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come, and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. Against all its walls, all ground, and against all the cities of Judah, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. Therefore, prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not dismay before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, and against the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Continuing on. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his incense. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon him, says the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. Neither did they say, where is the Lord who brought us out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts, and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruits and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land in my heritage. Um, sorry, I lost my spot. An abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And whose handle the law did not know me? The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus and see, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of the living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. 
So that's the passage. I know it's a lot. I felt like it would be helpful to read all of it. We're going we're gonna to kind of go back through now um, and touch on some things. So who's Jeremiah? Um, who do we see in this passage? And what does the word tell us about Jeremiah? So I'll be honest, when I, when I first started studying the book of Jeremiah, I definitely had, um, uh, I had never truly looked at the book. And, and I'm thinking in my head, Jeremiah is this great prophet, um, someone to uh, certainly want to emulate. Uh, and as I, as I really looked into his character, I realized, wow, Jeremiah had it really rough. Um, he was, he was uh, on a mission for about 40 years, um, just proclaiming the word of the Lord, but no one listened to him. Um, in the beginning of his life, we see in chapter 1, what did it say? He felt like he was too young, but then the Lord did something. He came, and he said, I'm going to put my word in your mouth. Um, what scripture does tell us as you do study is Jeremiah was a prophet and a catalyst for great spiritual reformation under King Josiah. He acted as God's faithful messenger in spite of many attempts on his life. He endured. Um, his audience was usually either apathetic or antagonistic. Um, no one really wanted to hear him. And, and I, I, I guess I didn't, I didn't realize the depth of that when I first started reading the book of Jeremiah. But Jeremiah's faithful. He's a rock star, right? Like, God loves Jeremiah. It's awesome. So let's, let's switch it over now. And so that's Jeremiah. Now, who's he talking to? Okay, so he's talking to the Israelites. And this struck me a little bit. We go back to that why question, right? Like, the church of the day was Judah, right? It was Israel. These people knew the Lord. They had the Torah. Um, it wasn't like like today, if we use the analogy, it was like Jeremiah was speaking to the church. He wasn't speaking to someone who didn't know Jesus at all. But like this is, this is God's best at the time, minus Jeremiah. Um, but Judah is God's people. It's all cities of Judah, not just unbelievers. Um, and they've broken the covenant with God that was written in the Torah. In a number of ways, they had adopted worship uh, of Canaanite gods, building idols, shrines um, all over the land. And because of their sin, Jeremiah uses some very bold language. He uses um, language like prostitution, promiscuity, unfaithfulness to describe how Israel has given their allegiance to other gods. I found myself very emotional actually reading Jeremiah recently, and I felt like I was starting to see God's heart and Jeremiah's heart as he walked these 40 years as God viewed his people who had turned their back on him. That was hard. And if you think about that, like, it takes a little while. I'm, I'm not an uh, overly emotional person, um, but when you, when you really start stepping back and realizing it and thinking about that, the emotion that the Lord must have felt, I can understand why Jeremiah was called a weeping prophet. Um, we have God's people turning their back on the Lord. <clears throat> so let's go to the third question. What does the Lord say? So out of the entire passage we just read, um, the last part is what stuck out to me the most. And, and this is actually what I, I used in my preaching class because I love analogies. Um, I love pictures. They help me uh, remember things. I'm just going to read the verse 13 of chapter 2 one more time. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. So, firstly, let's, let's just pull out some of the big words there, or, or, or the key words. And there's a lot of, it's packed full, like lots of imagery, right? So the first one, my people, a clear call to God's not saying it's like the, the, he's abandoned them. He's saying, this is my people. You guys wake up this. I'm trying to talk to you. F the words forsaken me. Um, they've turned their backs on the Lord intentionally. The word living waters, where do we see that out uh, in, in the rest of the scripture? We see it in the New Testament with Jesus, right? 
the lady at the well, she comes to him, um, and Jesus says, um, you know, if you would have asked for a drink, the Lord would have given you the true living waters. Uh, water in general. Like, let's just think about water for a second, okay? What, what is water? It's like the basis for life, right? Um, I don't want to drink murky, gross, disease-infested water. I want, like, Aquafina. That's pretty good, right? Uh, and the Lord uses, like, a simple term, living water. It's not, it's not even just water. It's living water. Um, I just use a definition because I like definitions. So water, it's colorless, it's transparent, it's odorless. This will be important later. Um, it's the basis of the fluids of living organisms. Let's go to another word, hewn themselves. What does hewn mean? Does everybody know what hewn means? It's, it's like putting together something, fashioning something with your hands. Um, they're doing something intentionally. They've hewn themselves last really important word, I think, is cisterns. And it's not only just cisterns, it's broken cisterns. So um, if you don't know much about like uh, water systems, a cistern back in the day was, or even today, sometimes what people use is they'll, they'll dig these, these holes underground um, and they'll form them. And what they'll do is they'll collect rainwater, they'll collect runoff, but it's not, it's not uh, um, supplied by like a well necessarily, it's just collecting everything, right? And as you guys know, the, the air's dirty, the ground's dirty. Um, but what we see in the scripture is that he says, you've, you've hewn cisterns with your own hands, replacing the living water, the fountain of living water. So language and times are very important. So let's break that down slightly. So the Lord isn't talking about Israel's ability um, in the plumbing trade, right? Like he's not critiquing your tech, their, their technology necessarily or their craftsmanship. Um, he, he's giving us an analogy uh, to look at, like what, what's going on here? Um, additionally, the climate of these times was a deteriorating society, uh, economical challenges, political and spiritual struggles, and the people of God were building idols to fulfill the desire within them. They weren't turning to the Lord. They were trying to handle it themselves. So I, I pondered a few questions as, as I was preparing for the message. Um, you know, who would set aside in the right mind, like going back to the why question, right? Uh, a fountain of living waters for a cracked cistern a pit that collects rainwater, um, but can't really even hold it. The, uh, the idea of like a fountain is there's a spring that's coming from, the, from the, the earth that's providing fresh, clean water. In a, in a, a cistern, um, I read one analogy or, or one explanation of cisterns. They said um, back in the day, the cisterns would they, they would create them, but it was a very dirty environment, and they were known for um, just standing water, mosquito larva, um, just fill in the blank, grossness, right? Um, and when I read this scripture about a year ago, it just really shocked me. I, I, I just couldn't get over that picture uh, because it, it was so telling, um, A lot, uh, in addition to um, Jesus' response uh, with the living waters comment. I just, I could not get past that. Um, so the Lord is saying, um, you've attempted to replace me, but you failed because there's nothing that can replace me. That's what we see. That's the, that's the main concept here. Uh, so how does this apply to us, right? What? Get to the point, Josiah. So the same pressure and truths apply today. Idolatry in our lives is not God's plan for us. In fact, it's sin. And that's what we should call it. We need to call it sin. So let's just take a few moments. And we're going to talk about idolatry. Because one of the mistakes that we can make is we can think of the golden calf as idolatry. 
and that, that's it. But we really need to say, well, what is idolatry to us in 2023? And do we have anything in our lives that we really need to lay down? So I'll give you a few definitions of what the internet will tell us or Webster's Dictionary. Um, first one, I'll start with Webster's, is uh, the worship of a physical object as a god. That's it. In my opinion, that lacks clarity for me as a Christian, right? Like, I kind of want a little bit more. Um, when we think of idolatry as only carved images or golden calves or false god, um, it, I need a little bit more. So, uh, Louisa mentioned Tim Keller. I've got a Tim Keller definition here, which I think is, is spot on. An idol is anything so central to your life that you can't have a meaningful life if you lose it. Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's think about that word before. If you study before, that, um, that means God is saying, don't have anything in front of me. Nothing gets placed above the Lord. Before me is, is a spatial term, right? So, so there's this bench right here. And God's saying, don't, don't put anything on, around, near me, or before me. Like, he stands alone. He should have a unique, a, a unique uh, place in our lives. I was listening to a, a, an interesting message. Um, it was a while ago by uh, Daniel Paladin. I highly recommend it on idolatry. And um, I'm going to steal one of the examples he said, or he used. And he was talking about... Um, like, what does it really mean to hold someone in, in, at the center of your life, right? Like, if, I, if you guys ask me, who's my favorite female? I'm going to say Louisa, right? Yeah. And if you ask me, who's your next favorite? If I can answer that, there's a problem, right? Because there's Louisa, and then there's everybody else. The space between Louisa and any other woman should be so far. But when we start having things encroach on that space, that's when things get in trouble. That's when marriages get in trouble. And the Lord wants us to hold that, uh, that take on him in our lives. Don't place anything before me or around me. Another great scripture is, is Exodus chapter 20, 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver, gods of gold, you shall not make them for yourselves. So right here, we, we just had the, the 10 commandments were given, and then the Lord's given a little bit further instruction. And he says, you shall not make anything to be with me. What does be with me mean? It means add to him. We should not be adding to the living waters. He's everything we need. You see, going back to the story in, in Jeremiah, they were adding things to the Lord. They were creating these cisterns. They were creating idols and religious systems, and they were banking on them. And we see throughout the whole Old Testament several examples of how infuriated the Lord gets when we start doing that. God is saying to the children of Israel, don't add to who I am. Don't give in to or fashion something you think I'm missing or try to make me more accessible. He doesn't need help, right? And as soon as we start trying to do that, that's when we get in trouble. As soon as we start bringing things into that space that we were just talking about, that's when we get in trouble. Third definition, giving to some created thing what only we should give to God. Or it's looking to some created thing for what only God can give. I'll be good. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I've, I've been guilty of this one with Louisa. I've looked to Louisa to fulfill something in my life that only the Lord can do. Do you realize that God, um, he doesn't even want your marriage to be above him. He wants to be the centerpiece. It's, uh, it's interesting because when, when you think about that, like, well, marriage is a good thing, right? 
there are so many good things in this world that can be turned into idols. That's, that's the danger of it. That's like one of the, the hooks that, that gets you is that the, anything can be turned into an idol. Anything. It can be a person. It can be, um, you know, an opinion, a political opinion. It can be your career. It can be your reputation. It can be your family. It can be your moral status um, or your moral record. It can be causes you're a fan of. We can turn anything into an idol. It's a person, idea, or thing that we make ultimate. It's when we take something good and we put it in front of the Lord. Now, you can look at all of history. That's like not a, a new idea, um, but it, it has happened. Um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful sunny day today. Well, there used to be sun gods. I'm, I'm not complaining about the sun, and I'm happy that the sun's shining today. But if I start bowing down to it, um, Luis is pregnant right now. Excited about that. We're, we're pretty close. But there's um, the goddess Diana, the fertility god. We can put um, Diana in front of, uh, or, or fertility of Diana, the fertility goddess, in front of the Lord. A um, couple other examples. Harvest, right? Like we can worship the harvest. Now we see this more in the Old Testament, but maybe if you're a farmer, you can be so focused on wanting to produce good crop. Um, the rain, that's another one. There were, there were rain gods that we see in the Old Testament. So anything that we're putting in the place of the Lord can be an idol. Here's a useful test. I like, I like the idea of like litmus tests to kind of constantly check myself, to autocorrect, make sure I'm not off in the ditches. So ask yourself, if I lose fill in the blank, what's your response? Is it if, or, 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 or let me back up, if, it, if it's, or if I don't get, you know, we could, we could prioritize, I remember when I was, when I was young and single, I, I desperately wanted to get married, I wanted a family, but if I say, well, if I never find my true love, I don't know if I want to go through life. I don't know if I want to live. Not sure that I went that far, but like we, we can take it and spin things that way. If, if that's our response ever, I want to challenge you this morning that there might be idols in your life. And, and I wouldn't just ask you to do it one time. I would ask you to do it regularly. We need to constantly be checking, you know, is there, is there an area in our life that we need to lay down? Is there a cistern that we're building, that we're hewning together, that's taking place? Of the Lord, the living, true living waters. Um, okay, so we've discussed Jeremiah. We've talked about the Israelites. We've talked about the fact um, of, of who Jeremiah is, his calling on him, um, and then the Lord kind of calling out sin of idolatry. But I want to go back to my question that I posed at the beginning of this message. Why? Why, when I understand a concept or a direction, do I still have trouble following through? Because that's where I got a little hung up with this. Is like, yeah, I get it, but, but still, why? Why did they do it? Um, when it's clear in Scripture, why do we as people um, who have even experienced the Lord, like really had encounters with the Lord, why do we still turn to idols? So I'll share with you two things that the Lord revealed to me and maybe it'll resonate with you. I, I think that it's applicable to all of us this morning. Um, but why do we turn to idols? Because we were created to worship, made for relationship, and we were made in God's image. We desire to be loved and wanted. So the Lord speaking in Isaiah 43, a great scripture about this. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. There's something in us that wants to praise. That's, that's part of God's design. Like, as the designer, he put that in us. The challenge is when we praise the wrong thing. We worship the wrong thing. And so the second, the second point, which I think is more significant for me, that really just jumped out at me, um, comes from Colossians 1.16. 
And, and it's the last sentence, but I'm going to read the whole thing. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principles or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So this is what jumped out to me. You're like, okay, yeah, Josiah, I've read it before. Great. What are you getting at? The last two words, for him. I'll tell you, I think everybody in the room that has experienced the Lord has no problem with saying, um, uh, I can't read it back there. I'll just read it here. Um, whether, okay, so for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth. Amen. Visible and invisible. Amen. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, amen. All things were created through him, amen. But I want to say for me. And when we say for me, it gets the order all out of whack. When we start saying, yep, Lord, we trust you. We want you to make everything um, perfect. We're so happy with this world that you designed for me. That's wrong. When my perspective is inward, instead of outward, that's wrong, that's sin. And that really jumped out to me because when we look at the, any of the examples that I, I put uh, up above, we talked about um, David and Bathsheba. They were looking at themselves, satisfying themselves. Eve, satisfying herself. Um, the people getting drunk on wine, satisfying themselves. The Israelites that we're seeing in, in, in Jeremiah, they were, they were trying to find security in themselves. They were trying to take control of the situation. They were creating these, these idols to basically make themselves feel good, to make them feel secure. And that's not how God designed things. And that can be maybe a, a point of contention or like frustrating for you. But if you think about it, it's actually not that frustrating. If I told you with your vehicle right now, um, that you had to put gas in the gas tank, you'd say, yep, makes sense. But what if someone came along and said, well, I want to put sand in the gas tank, and I want it to run? Well, that wouldn't work, right? Why wouldn't it work? Because that's not how the motor's designed. Um, your electricity in your home, if you said, well, instead of like being hooked up to the grid, I just want like water to power my electrical circuits. It's going to be a problem, right? Like, someone's going to get hurt there. Um, this building, right? Like, there's certain principles that, that hold true. You need a foundation under that wall. That's a load-bearing wall. Why? Because, because that's how design works. The, the problem is, is we want to challenge the, God's design, but that is how he designed us. It wasn't for him Oh, it, wasn't, it wasn't for me, it was for him, right? And, and once you start thinking, okay, well, the Lord has a perfect design. I can trust his design. He, he created me. I'm going to fully own that. Um, it makes it easier to understand. But when you don't do that, it's self-idolatry. It's putting yourself above everything else, above, every, above everyone else. Um, and, and I'm confident that you know, it might manifest itself in a golden calf. It might look like um, an economic system that you want to believe in. It might look like a savings account or a career. But ultimately what you're doing is you're removing the Lord. You're putting things around him or on him or ahead of him. And that's not what the Lord has for us. So this morning, I want to challenge you to not only evaluate if you're living for him, but more than that, understand that God's design and purpose is for your good. There's a reason for God's design. God knows how we're wired, right? Because he's the designer of us. He created us. And he knows how idols work. There's a great scripture in Psalm 135 that talks about how idols work. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, 
but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. An idol is just a piece of wood or might be money. It, it, it doesn't hear you, but the Lord hears you. And when we start replacing that idea or, or, or that, that area of your life, it's going to come up void. The Lord is the, the only one that hears us, um, that sees us, that knows what's best for us. So it's not that he just wanted in this scripture to poke the Israelites in the eye. He's broken for them. He's hurt because he's recognized his people that he loves have turned to things that, that will never satisfy one of the things that breaks my heart the most is when I think about, like, my children or, or my wife. And, and, like, I want them to flourish, um, to be uh, strong men and women as they grow up. And to think about them having any other path is, is I, I get a little emotional. Like, I, I, get, I get really sad. And the Bible talks about, like, a true father loves his son. How much more does the Lord love us? And so Jeremiah is living his life for 40 years and he's seeing these people and he's feeling what the Lord's feeling. And the Lord's like telling him messages and saying, go appeal to them, warn them, wake up guys. You are following idols. It's to your destruction. Don't you know there's a cliff ahead? And the Lord's like stirred up. Jeremiah is stirred up and we see that he gets a name. The weeping idol, like I, I, boy, that, or weeping prophet, I just, um, yeah, thanks, Louisa, not weeping idol. <laughs> um, boy, it's, it's just, it really stirs me when, when you think about it because it's, it's really showing us, it's, it's a, a peak of, of the Lord's heart. Oh, Lord, help us to see that all things were created through you and for you. Okay, so what should our response be this morning? Um, if, this, if this morning you're saying, you know, I've built cisterns in my life, cracked, broken cisterns. I've replaced the fountain of living water with something, wood, stones, an idea, a thought. We need to run to the Lord and lay these down at his feet and repent. So I mentioned at the very beginning, like I was in this funk over Christmas break, and I realized, you know, I am just looking to myself. I'm looking to, like, solve all the problems. And it really made me come to a point where I was like, I need to repent. Like, what are you doing, Josiah? Do you actually think you're in control? And I want to challenge you guys because the, the, we, we can too quickly say, oh, this is a word for the Old Testament. With idols, there's no golden caps in this room. And that's what the devil wants us to think. He wants us to think, this isn't a problem for you. But it is. I, I believe that in our society, we are too quick to try to replace the Lord with something of our day, some security, um, some intellect, some standing. It, and I'm preaching to myself here too, guys. <laughs> but we must respond. Repentance is a very powerful thing. <clears throat> so therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord. Repent and turn from your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your own. It's Ezekiel 18.30. So if you form broken cisterns or idols in your life that you need to lay down to the Lord, like Jesus' response to the lady at the well, Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked me and he would have given you the living waters. Let's repent. Let's pray. Do you know this morning that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Maybe, maybe this message is like the first time you're even hearing about Jesus and idolatry and what is he even talking about? Well, I want to say that the living waters is the hope in all of this. So Jeremiah is going through his 40-year his journey. Ultimately, 
we know that there's hope in the end. We know that the Lord sent his son, Jesus, who died on the cross to fill all the voids that we may have. But what I don't want us to do is go into another year thinking everything's good, leaving some idols in the closets, leaving some areas in our lives where we're like, yep, we trust the Lord, but I, you know, that area is for me, not for him. It's all for him. Let's recognize his design. Let's recognize his purpose, his place in our life, and put him first. So I'm just going to close in prayer, but I want you guys to to do some self-assessment right now. Because the worst thing we could do is hear a message, say, yep, that's me, but not respond. So I want you to think about where are those areas in our lives that we need to lay down to the Lord? And I'd even ask you, you know, run to the Lord. This morning, I'd ask you to come forward. I'd, I'd love to pray with you. There can be some people on the prayer team. We can pray for you. But then the second part is if you have never even accepted Jesus into your life, I, w- I want to encourage you that there is no place to turn other than Jesus in this world. The, the rest will be a broken cistern at best, disgusting, gross. That's the best we can come up with with our hands. It's not the fountain of living water. It's not God's design. It's not God's plan for our lives. So if you just bow your head with me, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the story in Jeremiah, Lord, that we can look at and look to to see this this imagery of, of a people that knew you but still turned to themselves who created false idols, who built, at best, broken cisterns that won't even hold water. Lord, just thinking about cisterns and and the idols and the idea that things just even creep in on those idols, the grossness of the water, the grossness of, of what the devil has for us and the trap that he wants to get us in. Lord, I pray that we would turn, that we would run to you, that we would lay these idols at your feet, if there are any. And God, I pray for those that are here today that have never put their trust in you, that have never uh, acknowledged you and your son and what you did on the cross. Lord, we, we, we hear and see in Romans that if we acknowledge you in front of man, you'll acknowledge us in front of the son. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Help us in this this upcoming year, um, God, to to walk with with boldness, with confidence in who you are, um, that as as these things come up, that we would often run the litmus test and say, ah, something off there. Is is this out of check? Lord, we thank you that you sent your spirit to speak to us. Amen. If you guys just want to stand to your feet, we'll sing a a song, but I I do want to encourage you, come forward if you'd like prayer for anything.
God and you alone are good. Amen. Great way to wrap it up today. Thank you, Josiah, for the encouraging and, and uh, convicting word there. It's like we all have a lot to, to chew on, I think, this week. At least I do, uh, for sure. So if you'd like prayer for anything at all, uh, please come up. There'll be members of the prayer team up here. If not, I hope to see you either tomorrow in Mawaira, Wednesday in uh, Governor, or especially here Thursday at 7 o'clock for prayer. Have a great week, everybody.